诸位之神，礼佛行三问训礼，一问讯。那。是释迦牟尼佛，那么本是释迦牟尼佛，那么本是释迦牟尼佛。心经，观自在菩萨心身般若波罗蜜多时，朝见无云皆空，度一切苦厄，舍利子。色不异空，空不异色，色即是空，空即是色，受想行识，一复如是，色离子，十足法空，相不生不灭。不垢不净不增不减，是故众无色，无受相行识，无眼耳鼻舌身意，无色身香味触法，无眼界乃至无意识界。无无明义，无无明净，乃至无老师，亦无老师经，无苦集灭道，无智，亦无德，无所得故菩提萨埵。一波若波罗蜜多故，心无怪无怪故，无有空不远离颠倒梦想，究竟涅盘三世诸佛，一波若波罗蜜多故。得阿耨多罗三藐三菩提，故知般若波罗蜜多，十大神咒，十大明咒，十无上咒，十无等等咒，能除一切苦，真是不虚。故说般若波罗蜜多咒，即说咒业界地界地波罗界地波罗僧界地菩提萨婆。Please be seated.
Okay, let's sit for a short while. <coughs> sit comfortably. Take a few deep breaths. As we breathe in, <coughs> be mindful and present with the breath. Be aware of how it feels to breathe in. Recollect the mind and settle down. As we breathe out, Be mindful and present with the breath. Be aware of how it feels to breathe out. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. As we breathe in, collect your mind and anchor it on the breath. As we breathe out, relax the body. In this way, we focus the mind and calm the body. We just sit for a while and then we will start the class. Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. How are you all today? Good? Uh, is this the ninth lesson or last lesson? Ninth, huh? Okay. <laughs> Where did we stop? We stop at the Four Noble Truths, yeah? Hmm. Ooh, yeah, we have come to the almost final part of the whole sutra already. Hang on in there. <laughs> almost enlightened. <laughs> oh, could me at all. So, have I finished the the fourth noble truth? Yes, huh? Mm. So, I think I wrap up highlighting that if we look at the fourth noble truth itself then we would see that the uh, the first two noble truths yeah they are directly 
uh, due to one, then the other arise. Yeah, and the uh, first two noble truth is really the the condensed form of or the uh, in a way like a highlight, yeah, highlight of the twelve links. Mm. Then the third noble truth. The third noble truth itself is uh, uh, is actually the same twelve links, yeah. Uh, but in the uh, in the sequence where uh, ignorance goes away, when ignorance goes away, then the rest uh, collapse, much like a domino. Yeah. Then how about the fourth noble truth? The fourth noble truth is an immediate condition for the third noble truth. Yeah. It is due to the practice that then enlightenment is possible. Uh, in a few suttas, in quite a few suttas, the Buddha highlighted. The Buddha, in many places, talk about uh, this Sachita Samuppada, the teaching on dependent arising, yeah, or conditional arising. Uh, usually, we think in terms of these twelve links, but besides these twelve links, he would also uh, mention many other other things that happen due to uh, interlinked condition. So, for example, he would say uh, it is because there is suffering. Yeah, with suffering as a condition, then there is uh, there is the uh, dispassion. Yeah, because of suffering, then you will feel dispassion towards this world, yeah, or the things that you are attached to. If the thing that you are attached to don't bring you suffering, for, the, for that matter, to begin with, what is wrong with being attached to it? <laughs> yeah. The only reason why we keep saying have to let go, have to let go, is because whatever we are attached to tend to bring us suffering, eventually. Maybe not immediately, but eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, the Buddha's point was that in that case, then, Suffering actually is an impetus that causes us to want to practice, yeah. want to uh, be free of it. And from that as an impetus, then causes us to lend ear, yeah, uh, associate with the wise. And then because of that, then becomes a condition for us to lend ear. From because of lending ear, then we have confidence and right view. Yeah. And then from right view, then as a condition, then right resolve, right intention arise. With right view and right uh, resolve and intention as a condition, then right speech, right action, right livelihood arise. With right view, right intention and resolve, plus right action, right livelihood, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood as a condition, then right effort can arise. Yeah, and with right effort, right mindfulness, with right mindfulness, right concentration. Of, of course, the last three is dependent on the first five. Yeah, and with all it as a condition, then uh, direct seeing arises. And because direct seeing arises, ignorance disappears. Yeah, or more correctly, we often say with the arising of wisdom, then ignorance disappears. Yeah, or ignorance is eradicated, or ignorance is removed. <coughs> uh, <coughs> can one of our <coughs> sister uh, perhaps help me switch off one of the light, uh, or brother for that matter, or anyone, anyone with hands and legs can help me. <laughs> Just one of the light. Yeah, very good. So, uh, um, okay. So and which light went off? Uh, uh, the cent- center row. Yeah, this cent- center row. So, how how would you describe this phenomena? <coughs> what just happened? Mm, very good. You see, by the ninth lesson, you all see this, and you don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, using normal terms, yeah, your day-to-day description. What happened? Yes, very good. 
Someone switch off the light. So what happened to the light? Huh? Yeah, we switch it off. There's no more light. What we can say is that there's no more light coming out. Uh, now, there's still light over here. Okay? Let's imagine that this light is over here. Okay? Imagine that light is this light. Okay? Now, I would, maybe you can switch on again. <laughs> Yeah, on, on. Okay. <clears throat> yes, very good. Let there be light. And there was light. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, just as our sister switched off the light, I would switch off the light. So we would say that the light has went off light disappeared. Uh, now, in the case of switching off the light, uh, if you look at this page, it is now lighted. Okay? When I press the button, it is no longer lighted. Yeah? But if I were to do this, it is also not lighted. Isn't it? Yeah? Uh, when I do this, I'm causing it not to arise. I'm stopping it from arising. Or one could say I remove the light source. Yeah. Uh, or I could, I could do this. Then this is no longer lighted. It's I have removed the light source. Here light don't represent wisdom. Huh? Okay, you must understand the analogy here. Okay? Then there's one more way, which is what I've, I've done just now, what our sister did, which is to do this. Can someone tell me the difference between the two? The, f the first one is when I do this or I do this, okay? The second one is that I do this. What is the difference between these two actions? Think about it. Huh? Okay. Beyond the clarity of the notes, let's focus on the light itself. Yeah. Someone from that side? Someone mentioned something? Stopping the light differently. Okay. Uh, in the first case, I am stopping. Very good. In the first case, I stop the light. Yeah. And indeed, as we stop the light, then the notes is not lighted. Huh? Yeah. But let's focus on the light itself. And we say, it seems like I'm stopping the light differently. In the first case, I stop it from hitting the paper. The second case, I turn it away so it's not hitting the paper. Yeah? This will be akin to when you are angry and then you block the anger. Yeah? You suppress the anger. You hold it in. This way is uh, in a way like you are angry at this person, then you go for shopping. So you shine your anger somewhere else. <laughs> okay? But actually, the, the source of anger is still not removed. Yeah? In the case of Nibbana, when you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, you, you are not blocking off, you are not suppressing the light. You are not turning it away so people don't see the anger here. Okay, what we are doing eventually, yeah, is we totally switch off the source. Yeah, it is that ignorance don't arise anymore. It is that anger don't arise anymore. Yeah, in a way, conventionally we say we remove the light, we remove ignorance, but it is not that we are removing ignorance really. It is that ignorance don't arise anymore. You see the difference? Yeah? Uh, because the cause of the ignorance has been removed. Ignorance requires us not to see correctly. It's because we don't see correctly, then we call that ignorance. It is because of that influence. It is because in the past we have always not seen 
correctly. It is because we have always related to it in a certain way. Yeah? It is because there is occlusion due to our wrong thinking, yeah? our discursive thoughts. And that's why through the Noble Eightfold Path, um, when there's that clarity, then there's direct seeing. And with direct seeing, yeah, then ignorance don't arise anymore. Mm. It is because ignorance don't arise anymore, we say, now there's wisdom. Wisdom is basically that you see correctly. Yeah. So it is not as though there's some ignorance that you're removing, you know. Understand? Yeah, it's not as though there's some tangible wisdom that you go and pluck out and throw it away. Understand? Like now when you switch off the light, it's not as though I have to take the light, keep on taking the light and throw it away. Whereas for this case, when I block it, it's still coming out, you know. It's just that I'm, I'm stuffing it back in. <laughs> of course, for light, you can't stuff it back in. Yeah? Uh, or when I shine this way, it doesn't shine here, but it's shining somewhere else. Understand? Huh? But once you, when you, as you practice, now, let me see. Uh, uh, this LED light doesn't have a dimmer function. <laughs> yeah. If they, if they were to start switching it on and off in a 80% duty cycle, 70% duty cycle, yeah, that means the on duration is slightly longer than the off duration, then it will start to appear to be dimmer and dimmer. If it flickers at about 60 per seconds, yeah, uh, 60 times per second, you wouldn't detect the flicker, yeah, and it will appear to be dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Our light dimmer usually works in that way. Yeah? And in that way, then the intensity of ignorance is reduced yeah? until some time where it's totally off. Yeah? The first part, where if, if we manage to actually re reduce the intensity, that is what we call tiao fu fan now. Yeah? As we practice, we resolve the, the wrong thinking. Yeah. And our our reaction becomes milder and milder. It is not that we are suppressing it in. Uh, until eventually one day when something happened and you you see you, you observe yourself and hey, I, I no longer see it that way anymore. Hey, I I'm not affected anymore. <laughs> yeah? And in fact, once you're not affected and if you are to revisit the situation, then you will you may see that my goodness, the other party is suffering. <laughs> that you start to see that the other party is suffering. Yeah? It's, and it's not, it's not about, oh, poor me, I'm, I'm, I'm also with you, <laughs> I'm this, I'm that. Yeah? And even when the other person is the aggressor, you see that the person is really suffering. And when you see it that way, there's no uh, injustice. Yeah. You don't feel like, hey, Bikong Peng Ma, every time he, he, he bully me, then now I still have to see that he's suffering. Suffering what? He bully me, I, he, he suffer. <laughs> mm. yeah. But once you see it clearly, once you, once you see it clearly, the attachment to this so-called I is no longer there. And most importantly, you see clearly the whole set of conditions. Then you realize that the more you, s you look at the other person, the more you see how the end result is what we are so caught up with. But all the, the, the causal relationship behind it are all different forms of suffering, yeah, resulting in the aggression, yeah, the, the, the wrongdoing and so on. Yeah. So, the Four Noble Truth, the fourth, third and fourth yeah, are also likewise dependent on conditions that they conditionally arise and then uh, and they are not inherent as well what that means is that um, if we look at the reverse if enlightenment is inherent 
is innate, is inborn. Then either you are born with it, yeah, or you have to refer to Maybelline. Okay, you all didn't catch it, huh? <laughs> you know the Maybelline advertisement? Maybe I am born. Maybe you are born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. A very long time ago, advertisement. I don't know whether it's, it's still on. Huh? <laughs> okay, no. Yeah. So <laughs> it is a cosmetic advertisement. Cosmetic. Yeah. So either you are born with. If if enlightenment is inherent and inborn, then either you are enlightened or you are not. There's no way around it. But because enlightenment, can, you can attain enlightenment through conditions. Yeah. So today you are not enlightened. Yeah. Maybe some of you are enlightened. Yeah. Uh, but even if you are enlightened now, your enlightenment is due to the past practices as condition that you become enlightened. Yeah. Just like the Buddha, just like Guan Yin Pusa, just like Pusen Pusa, Wen Su Su Pusa, Di Zhang Pusa, <coughs> just like all the Buddhas throughout all times. And likewise, in future, yourself. Yeah. So, uh, the Four Noble Truth plus the earlier one, the Twelve Links. Yeah. This is correlating to the second verse. Puko yeah. Puting. That the path of impurity and the path of purity are both dependent, arising and conditional. Empty in nature, <coughs> so we are not we are not inherently unenlightened. That we must be unenlightened. Yeah, others are also not inherently like that. Yeah, must be stupid like that. Must act foolishly. No, no, not not inherent. Can change. Yeah, can change. Okay. Uh, what it also means is that um, <coughs> to me. It, uh, it is a it is a teaching and a message of of the potential that we have. Yeah. That sometimes in our life it may seem very bleak and very difficult, yeah, very overwhelming. Yeah. But know that whatever difficulties we are going through, uh, that is also dependent arising and yeah and changing. And even when we do some wrong, yeah. Uh, we should recognize that it's wrong. We shouldn't um, gloss over it. But we shouldn't start to have the sinner men mentality. Oh, I'm a, I'm an evil person. Yeah, I have, there's no reprieve for me. Yeah, there's no way for me to change. No. In this teaching, we should then highlight to ourselves, know that it is not true. That we can change. We should, from that potential forgive ourselves for doing that wrong. Yeah. As much as oftentimes when we in the Buddhist tradition we do repentance puja. Yeah. Hoping to get Buddhas not of the head. Yeah. That okay, okay, I know you did wrong, ah, okay, forgive you. Yeah, but in Buddhism um, besides besides that and actually not so much the Buddha forgive you or not, huh? But more whether you can forgive yourself or not. Whether we can forgive ourselves. Mm. And from that forgiveness to put the resolve not to do it again. Yeah. Not to do it again. That we have this ability not to do it again. Mm. Oh. And then on the flip side, that while we are not enlightened, no, we don't have wisdom, or we have little wisdom, or we have much wisdom. Yeah, but all this, <coughs> the presence of wisdom, or lack thereof, uh, we can work towards it. Yeah, we can work towards it. Mm. Yeah. So we don't have to look at the Buddha and say, "Ah, the Buddha is is like that, or he's Buddha, ma. Uh, he's not inherently Buddha." Many years back, <coughs> uh, in the first year of my monkhood. Uh, when I was in Taiwan, uh, there was a retreat that my ordination teacher, my late ordination teacher, conducted. So after the retreat, then there was another retreat, uh, what we call uh, Fuochi. So after a Chan, 
Chan San Si. <clears throat> After 30 days of meditation retreat, then followed by seven days of uh, chanting retreat, yeah, chanting of Buddha's name. So within that uh, retreat, then he highlighted to us, how should we do repentance? When we are paying respect to the Buddha during the repentance, yeah, uh, we, will, we will do the chanting, Namo I Side, one side will be bowing down, the other side will be chanting. Yeah. Then up to a certain point, tiang, this side stand up, then the, the other side bow. Yeah. Long time ago when I did this as a lay person, it was just a very strenuous process. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes you may hear people cry and <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So my teacher explained to us, he said, when you're doing this and you're bowing down, the whole part of you being like on the floor and, and, and down, bowing there is to reflect upon the wrongs that we have done. Yeah? Both in the past, potential past life and also in the present life including the whatever we have done in this life. And then to consider that these mistakes may repeat in the future. When we say we repent for the future, it is to consider that we do not want to do it again in future. Yeah? And at that point in time, he then said, we should further, as we bow to the Buddha, the various Buddhas, the various Bodhisattvas, we should consider. So many years ago, uh, so many eons ago, so many lives and eons ago, the Buddha was just like you and me. Just like you and me. With worries. Yeah? With family, with worries. Yeah, with concern, with anxiety, fear, with fear of of bad things happening, with concern for the welfare of our family and loved ones, yeah, with anxiety over what may or may not happen, yeah, with all these things and throughout all that, sometimes doing wrong things, sometimes acting out of fear, sometimes acting out of out of frustration sometimes acting out of desire and greed. Other times, due to too much injustice, there's too much, too much resentment that we act out of anger. Yeah? The Buddha was once like us. Then my teacher said that, but one day he decided that he wants to change, that he wants to set a resolve towards enlightenment, that he's not going to just continue his life this way. He's going to work towards his own perfection so that he can be uh, capable yeah, of helping others without harming them. Yeah, sometimes we want to help people, you know. Then help halfway, harm them. Yeah. Uh, but of course, not to discourage people and then, oh, so who is enlightened and who can help people, you know? Help as much as you can, uh, but you must have the wisdom to know when to stop. <laughs> uh, so, the Buddha was once like us, but as he started to work on himself, yeah, not in, with selfish in, intention, but so that he can be able to help others. One year, two years, three years. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, until it's one life. One life, two lives, three lives. 10 lives, 20 lives, 30 lives. Unless, until it's a thousand lives. A thousand, two thousand, three thousand lives. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 lives. Until it's so huge, you have to use a different unit to describe it. Yeah. When they call it, when they use the, the word a thousand, a thousand, uh, un until they call it uh, a kaupa, yeah, an eon. Until they have to say uh, so many kaupa that they call it a thousand kaupa. 
And by thousand, it doesn't mean just a thousand. It becomes a huge number. And then you, they call it a small thousand kalpa. A small thousand meaning that there's so many thousand, but still a small number. Then a huge number of that small thousand kalpa, then you call that a big kalpa. Yeah. Then many, many of this, they call it three asankeya kalpa. <laughs> yeah. Three great asankeya kalpa. Santa asan chi jie. And after such a long time, after such a long time, finally he perfected every single aspect of himself. On his end, reached 10 stage. Stage 10 Bodhisattva. Stage 10 Bodhisattva. Yeah. Then until such time where, ah, now in this Saha world, ah, now in India, ah, there are some individuals who are able to listen to the teachings. Okay, let me arise as a Buddha. Yeah? Now is the time. Now is the condition. There are those who, with, who have little dust in their eyes, who can understand. Okay, arise in the world and go through the whole process. Go through the whole process. Yeah? Until such time where whoever has, has the conditions to be taught by him has already been taught. Whoever through this teaching can attain enlightenment, the potential has been maxed out. The conditions, the link with the Buddha, the direct link with the Buddha has been sort of expanded already. Okay. Then, Tu Zha Yi Tu, Wei Tu Zha Yi Zhong Xia San Gen Fu De Yuan. Then, okay, my job is done. Yeah. But at that point, the Buddha further asked, yeah, hinted to Varabha Nanda, Kulain Kebo. Hinted to Varabha Nanda that if anyone were to request for the Buddha to stay on, uh, uh, then the Buddha can stay for an extended duration uh, for the welfare and benefit of all. Now, this, this process of requesting is actually the same process of uh, Brahma Sahampati when he first attained enlightenment. So in the Pusian Sing Yuan Ping, there's one Qing Fu Zhu Si, Qing Zhuan Fa Lun. In a way, they are very identical. Because when you request for the, for the Buddha to stay, it's not a Buddha. Uh, it's stay for one more Kapala. <laughs> I got a party next week, I want to invite you over. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. The Buddha only arise and stay for one and one purpose. Yeah. For the welfare and benefit of sentient beings. To to give the teaching, to show the way, so that sentient beings can be liberated. It's for this purpose that Buddhas arise in the world. We arise in this world for different reasons. We arise in this world due to our craving. Yeah. So because of this kind of arising there's suffering. And why, why is this the case? Because we, we find that this place is quite so attractive. Oh. <laughs> so is, we are driven in this way. But we are not totally driven in this way also. <clears throat> sometimes we care for people. Yeah? So sometimes our existence don't bring so much suffering. <laughs> yeah? Especially for humans, we, we have a bit of feelings and a bit of wholesomeness. So it's a very fair, fair system. Huh? <laughs> But for the Buddha, because he no longer craves, so all his arising is purely to benefit people. Yeah. So when he arises, minimal problem. Yeah. Whatever p- problem he encounter is then the the, the text describes that is because there are still some imprint from way back. Yeah, that is still not resolved. So even as the Buddha arises and he's helping people, those that has been planted way back, <coughs> if it's time to to appear, it will appear. Yeah. So it said that the Buddha had headache, don't know, for three days because he hit some f- a fish three times. Yeah. Uh, because of the of these fishes. Yeah. Long time ago he was with, he was born together with this he was with this group of uh, youth and they were they were about to like kill all these fishes. So they they are all friends, so they, they invited him, come, join us. Let's kill all these fishes, and we, you know, I think are supposed to eat, la. But he was very kind, and he was like, 
Then out of like peer pressure, he just took the stick and just hammered on the fish like three times. And then he ran away or something. Those who were killing the fishes uh, is said to be the Sakyan family, yeah, Sakyan clan. And then those who were the fishes is the uh, Prince Ajatata, I think it's Ad Prince Ajatataru, uh, that, that clan. Mm. So when the Buddha saw that, that Prince Ajatasuwang, <laughs> Ajasatasaru. Okay, I always tongue twist over here. So this prince marched towards uh, Kapilavastu to wipe them out. Yeah. So the Buddha saw he go and sit along the path, yeah, wait for them to come. And when the when the prince come over, the prince respect the Buddha a lot. So got all the you know, the chariot and everything, and ah. Blessed one, what are you doing here today? <laughs> like sitting like in the middle of the road, you know? Oh. Then the Buddha gave him some counsel and advice, you know, about peace and living in harmony, blah 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 blah. Or then he okay, okay, don't fight, let's not let's go back. Then after going back, oh the minister again. Hey, you know the Kapilavastu people, the Sakyan, uh, wow, Kwan Be Kilang, uh, wow, what <laughs> look us no up. Wow, we must uh, Okay, second time much forward. The Buddha interceded again. Uh, a third time, they marched. So the Buddha uh, is said to observe and saw that, yeah, this is the, this is the karmic imprint. Yeah, it's, it has already reached fruition. Even if you do this, that way, uh, can, cannot stop it. Can't stop it. Yeah, can't stop it. Unless, unless the, 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 the 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 group uh, yeah that is trying to attack unless in th- in them arise wisdom such that they don't act upon that karma yeah but it is said that there's one part of this account that says that the venerable Mahakashapa tried to save some of them yeah so took some of them with his rope yeah he has spiritual power rescue them and bring them up to heaven free from the war. Yeah, the the rest of the clan were all wiped out, and those who were saved, when he reached the heavenly realm and opened up, the description is that become it just turned into blood. Yeah, those who res- whom he rescued still turn into blood. Ting mm. Yeah, this is similar to the other the other account in the Jataka about this goat. Have you ever watched the show Little Buddha? Uh, Keanu Reef, <laughs> Little Buddha. Yeah, so, at the start of the of the movie, there's this story of the of the goat that cried and laughed. Yeah, I'll tell you the story next week. <laughs> yeah, uh, but similarly, the goat couldn't escape. Yeah, because of the karma. So, <coughs> um, even for the Buddha, yeah. So when the Buddha saw uh, all this, it's is still dependent on conditions. Yeah. When he arrives in this world, he teach. But after he has taught everything that can be t- taught, yeah, he goes his way. For us, sometimes we we arise because of our craving, sometimes because of good, sometimes because of bad. Yeah. So my teacher says, when we bow down to the Buddha to do repentance, we should consider we have this potential also. We have this potential. Yeah. We should not waste this potential. As we bow down and repent, we pay respect to the Buddha, we should consider, ah, the Buddha long time ago was just like you and me, but through cultivation, Sri Asankhya Kapa has attained enlightenment. And now a sculpture, a carving is made in, in memory, in honour of the qualities of that striving. Yeah, it's not just about a person, you know. It's about the three asankhya kapa of of practices. Yeah, when we look at a Buddha image, it represents that three asankhya kapa. Yeah, and that's why many times, last time, you know, I hear about all oh, all sculptures must be carved in a certain way according to the 32 marks of a great man and the 80 minor marks. Yeah, 三十二相八十岁好. 
The reason is because all those marks is is symbolic, yeah, or is is due to the practices. Yeah. So when you see this, it represents the three asankhya kapha of practice. Yeah. That this potential is in us also. Yeah, it's in us also. Mm. So when we look at this uh don't think wow, this sutra tells us no four noble truth. No. It is that there's no inherently innate four noble truth. Yeah. That our suffering is not innate in us. That enlightenment, although we are not enlightened now, we have the potential to be enlightened. Yeah. So this is really to spur us to say, hey, we can become enlightened. Yeah. But for us it's like that. For the for the enlightened beings, yeah, for the enlightened beings, uh, then it takes on a slightly different level. For those who are Arahans uh, and Pachuka Buddha, uh, their final destination is not Bodhisattva path. Their final destination is to enter Parinibbana. Yeah, enter Parinibbana. So for for those who are already enlightened, under the two vehicles, then this part of the teaching is to highlight that um, do not then dwell in Parinibbana. Yeah? Because the path of of impurity of suffering is also dependent co arising. Yeah? It's also conditional. The path of of uh, of purity is also such. You don't have to be so attached to this 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 two. Yeah? You have already an attained enlightenment. Fan now ji puti, yeah, chan zhong de hua. Yeah, within the Zen tradition, fan now ji puti. Within your defilement is enlightenment. Yeah, within samsara is nibbana. Uh, we usually start off with samsara and nibbana being separated. Yeah. Yeah. Is nibbana and samsara separate? Say yes. Yes. For us, we must look at it as separate. Yeah, uh, you should. If you are attached to this distinction, it's fine. Yeah, because for those of us who are not enlightened yet, if you are to think, oh, fun now, ji puti, wow, let me have more fun now. <laughs> yeah. So for those who are not enlightened yet, seeing the distinction is important. But once you have become enlightened, grasp holding on to this distinction is going to stop you from coming back to samsara to help people. Yeah. Uh, so for those who become enlightened already, such as Arahant <coughs> and Pachika Buddha, then this part of the teaching is to highlight that actually there's no separate nibbana, you know, yeah, there's no separate nibbana. Within samsara is nibbana, yeah. The two are not the same, but they are not separated also, yeah. And that is how Bodhisattvas are able to reappear again and again in samsara and endure so much so-called hardship because they see that the hardship is not inherent. Yeah? So for us, we think, wow, siong ah, siong ah. Ah, quickly I want to get enlightened. That's good. This way we want to be enlightened. <coughs> for the, but for the Bodhisattva, even as they, they may appear just like us, yeah? go through work, yeah, COE go up, they also have to pay more money. Yeah. Uh, when the housing bubble collapse, if they have investment in that, they also lose it. Yeah. <coughs> the difference is, they are not attached to it, so they don't suffer over it. Yeah. Uh, but maybe, maybe, some of the Bodhisattvas, in order to show people how suffering it is, they may also put on a show and suffer, <laughs> and tell people, wow, say tsam <laughs> Oh, they tell people that there's problem in this, you know. Yeah. But actually inside them no problem. Yeah. Much like how we deal with kids, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes they oh, pin pin oh, pin pin actually not pin <laughs> In a way we are lying, huh? But we are just trying to highlight to the kid that there's some problem, you know. Yeah. So <coughs> this stage for Buddhist 
is really uh, no for the arahants and Pachika Buddha, uh, for them to be able to progress be- beyond just going for nirvana, so so that they can start the bodhisattva path. Okay, for bodhisattvas, this portion, no problem. Yeah, of course for Buddha, no problem. <coughs> the earlier part, the earlier part, yeah, the first. There are three parts, right? And the first part is where we are stuck. So it's primarily for us to overcome. The Arahans and above, Arahans, Patrika, Buddha, Bodhisattva and Buddha, no problem. Yeah? They are no longer attached to worldly things. We are attached. So directly for us. This second part, for us to see the potential, for us to be enlightened. But for Patrika, Buddha, Arahans, to realize that this this distinction is, is is not so tangible and real as well. Yeah? Yeah, then they can walk the Bodhisattva path. Then from there we go on to the third stage. Wu Zi Yi Wu De, the next page. Wu Zi Yi Wu De. So here. From worldly things to the path, yeah, the path of purity and impurity, to finally the fruit, mm. the outcome, yeah, the outcome. Wu zi yi wu de. Here, no wisdom, no attainment. Wow. Can be quite a shock if you read read it literally or, or on the surface. Yeah. So what does it mean? Again, it is that there's no inherent wisdom. That you you cannot j- just say, oh, I uh, I have wisdom or I don't have wisdom. When there are conditions, then you can see co- clearly and correctly. And because you see correctly and clearly, then you call that wisdom. Yeah. When is there absence of wisdom? There's absence of wisdom when you don't see correctly, yeah, as mentioned earlier. So this wisdom that we talk about is not something uh, separate out there that you go and acquire. It's simply it's still five aggregates, you know. <laughs> when arahants attain enlightenment and they have wisdom, it's still five aggregates. Huh? It's just that they see it differently. Yeah. In many ways, you know those uh, optical illusion, optical illusion, some picture, you look at it, uh, it looks like a beautiful young woman, but within that same picture is an old woman. Yeah? You, have, you have seen those before? Yeah? In many ways, the Buddhist, Buddhist teaching can be described in, uh, in a similar sense. Yeah? Uh, it's still the same thing, but it says that whether you see it or don't see it, uh, that's all. Yeah. So this wisdom is not inherently in us, yeah. Uh, but when there are conditions, then this wisdom arises, and this wisdom is basically the non-arising of ignorance. And if ignorance itself is dependent, arising, and conditional then the non-arising of it cannot be otherwise. Yeah. If you think about it, <coughs> is there two separate things called wisdom and ignorance? Is there two separate things called wisdom and ignorance? The answer is either yes or no. In Indian logic, yes or no Neither yes nor neither no, neither not yes nor not no. <laughs> yeah, four quad possibility. See a lot. Yeah, but it, uh, this is this is, this is parallel to the Greek, the Greek form of logic. Today, computer logic is mainly derived from uh, gr- the Greek log- logicians, uh, the philosophers. Uh, now. So is there, is there, is there two different things, or is it just one thing? 
Yeah. Is it two different things, or three things, or four things? Yeah. Or is it just one thing? Consider this question. Uh, in this world, is there heat and cold? How many of you? Let me think about it first. Okay. Let me repeat the question. Okay. Is there heat and cold? Okay, think about it. How many of you think that there is heat and cold? Okay, good. How many of you don't think that there is heat, as in, don't think that there is this separation of heat and cold? Okay. How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Do you all know how this icon work? How this icon work? This icon works. It feels like it's blowing cold air. That icon produces cold, isn't it? But if you really go and look for scientific dictionary, Coal don't exist. Aircon don't produce coal. Do you know what aircon do? Aircon remove heat. There's no coal in this world. Coal is our perception. <laughs> this class is crazy. Coal don't really exist. Coal is our perception of the absence of heat. Because of heat gradient, due to heat loss, you experience that as cold. But it feels very real, isn't it? It's in Jingang, Kyanzik Jingang, or Siling. But actually, there's only heat. We perceive this change of heat, yeah? this redu reduction of heat as cold. And for that matter, we perceive heat as an increase of heat of energy. <laughs> so there's only energy <laughs> and the absence of energy. In a way, you can say there's two things. Yeah? But the second thing is built on top of the first thing. It's not a separate thing, you know. Let me illustrate huh? with, with some writing. Oh, this part quite chim. Huh? <laughs> no, actually it's not chim. Huh? It's something that has, it's, it's so common, you know, just like, like laksa aircon. No? You have been, how, how long have you all been using aircon? 10 years, 20 years? Yeah, at least 20 years, maybe. Yeah, if not 30 years. 30 years, okay, uh, a bit tough. La. 80s, very few people have aircon. Uh, lesser, la, not, I wouldn't say very few. Okay, so consider this, okay. Here, there's X, okay? And then, so I draw two boxes. What is the difference between these two boxes? Assuming the box is the same. Uh, huh? I know nowadays on, on Facebook, there's a lot of those, those mathematical questions with banana, la, apple, la, orange. <laughs> I, after the first one, I saw a lot of different combinations. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, are we... Are we saying that the ability to use uh, algebra to do uh, complex abstract mathematics is no longer useful? That we should all express our mathematical equation with cars and <laughs> table and chair, apple, orange. So ridiculous. So anyway, this is not that. Huh? Okay? So don't go and say, uh, Sifu Fu draw this, this part is not joining, this part is joining. No, these two are just square. And inside the first square is an X. Inside the second square, there's no X. Yeah, correct? One could say that these are two different things because there's one X here and there's no X here. Yeah? But in fact, you can also represent these two with one thing. Have X and no X. Isn't it? It's actually, there's only one thing, X. Yeah? If I ask you, on this page, how many alphabets are there? Only one, right? What is the alphabet? Yeah. 
all the while there's only one X. But now you give it another name. For the absence of X, we call it, let's say, A. Where A is equals to not X. Yeah. Yeah, or this is computer, uh, or in maths it'll be complement X. Yeah, complement is the absence of it. Uh, okay? Uh, or you can write as in English, no X. Okay? Can? Uh, understand? Yeah. If you change, if you replace no X with A, then it seems like, no, Sufu got two things, ma. Got two things. Yeah. Out of convenience, we. we we, we use this to describe this world. And because this world is always about duality. So we describe this world with, with labels. But after using the label a while, we start to think that this is a real thing, you know, that A really by itself exists. Eh? <laughs> huh? Understand? Then now suddenly there's two things. Oh. Originally there's only one thing. <laughs> and now if you can understand this, then we come back to the heat. If this is heat, yeah, or more correctly, energy, then A is the absence of energy. And we experience this as coal. We give it a special name called coal. We label it. But actually, it is still just the absence of heat, yeah, or the decrease of heat. But we, once we keep calling it cold, then it seems like there's really something called cold, ma, and somehow we can feel it. <laughs> yeah? Can you all follow up to this point? Who cannot follow? My pai say, oh, please. Oh. <coughs> we only record the audio. Is it recording audio? Huh? Is it recording audio? Yes, huh? Oh, okay. <coughs> we are only recording audio. So it doesn't record your, your raising of your hand. So the uh, audience on you on you internet cannot laugh at you. <laughs> so, hey, they're fool. <laughs> yeah, so everybody clear? Is there anybody with any question or doubt up to this point? Yeah. Because this part of the explanation is actually in a way very simple. If you can understand. Can I understand? You will go back and like, huh? So far, think about it. Don't 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 get pressured while well, nobody raised their hand. Yeah. Everybody clear? So later as we are going out, if I just randomly pull a few of you out, you can explain, huh? <laughs> so aircon don't produce coal. It removes heat. And if you look at uh, a diagram of the air conditioning process, where there's a coolant, and then there's the fin, yeah, and through change in the pressure, uh, pressure, <laughs> pressure, pressure, the compressor actually forces the the the, the coolant. In most cases, uh, using freon, yeah. Although now they are new, use new uh, material, yeah, fluid, and through that process, then it causes uh, the, the, like some kind of evaporation or something. Yeah? And it draws heat. And so our, our air is then circulated. Yeah? Or there's, there's this, there's this uh, internal thing that draws the heat over there, transfer the heat over to the coolant. Yeah? The, why it's called coolant is to... It's actually not coolant uh, in a way. It's heat drawer. <laughs> Uh, it draws the heat away and then goes to the fin and there's usually some fan involved yeah, to blow the heat away. Yeah, and that's why in air conditioning, there's always this unit outside the room. And that's why those in-room aircon unit uh, always only give you localized cooling. It doesn't cool, up, cool down the whole room. In fact, the rest of the room usually becomes hotter. Yeah, because it's drawing heat from this area yeah, away yeah, to somewhere else. But when we say draw the heat away from this area, it doesn't make sense, but it's blowing cold air out. Actually, <coughs> there's one part of the vent that sucks air in. Yeah, it sucks air in. Like this thing here, 
the four vents blows air out. Right below, there's nothing. Then what is this huge thing here? It sucks air in. Yeah? And goes in, there's a heat exchange inside. Okay? So bonus. You attend Hearts to Try, you learn how aircon works. <laughs> yeah, don't believe, go and Google. This is really how it works. The same process happens for refrigerator. Yeah? But refrigerator has another secondary heating, heating element to prevent frosting for modern fridges. Don't ask me how I know all this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just crazy this way. I read too much. Uh, about maybe about seven years ago or eight years ago, I wrote an article about this. Yeah, from Laksa. Uh, in between, uh, I can't remember which one came first, but I wrote something about refrigerators and fridge. Yeah, and it was it has to do with global warming, because if you think about it, our air conditioner is like a fridge. Yeah, we are we are cooling down the whole room, but we are just removing the heat and passing out into the air, you know. Yeah. So recently I saw an article by scientists who actually talked about this. I was like, oh, I was right after all. <laughs> because the total heat it remains constant. Ma. Yeah. The, the earth don't lose more heat simply because we produce more heat. It doesn't do that. Yeah. So as, we are, you, as everybody uses aircon, we are heating up the, the air outside. We are removing heat from inside outwards. Y yes, yes. It doesn't churn out here. It's at the compressor outside. Yeah. And that's why sometimes if you walk past that place, then you feel, whoa, hot air. Yeah. But these days, some of the, those green movement or, or those engineers, they come up with a way to tap onto the heat, the waste heat. Yeah. And they use that for heating and other things. Yeah. But in Singapore, who needs heating? <laughs> yeah. hot, hot water, la, maybe. Uh, hot water. So if you can understand that so far, okay, then if we replace heat with, with uh, defilement, okay, we replace heat with defilement, then... Uh, and, and heat, X, okay, we replace X with defilement, replace X. With uh, suffering, replace X with ignorance. Then A, which is the absence of it, what will it be? Wisdom. Yeah. Suffering would be no suffering, isn't it? And suffering is samsara. No suffering is no suffering is nibbana, huh? Or nirvana. So the attainment of enlightenment is also not something tangible outside that you can go and get enlightenment. <laughs> yeah, that's always only samsara. <laughs> yeah, but the Buddha, if the Buddha start off with this, then people are like, huh? Then we are stuck in samsara. <laughs> yeah, I hope by in at this stage, as I share this, you don't get into that confusion. Uh, that at this stage, you can appreciate that it is this gradual path, gradual pros procession of understanding. Yeah? Although we have not attained up to that stage yet, but I hope you all can appreciate where this is coming from. Yeah? And don't go back and, and like, one leo, one leo. <laughs> yeah? All this hard work. Yeah? Wow, all the forty and whatever. Oh, in the end, we are still going to be stuck in samsara. <laughs> Samsara is a name for suffering. Yeah. But if you consider this place itself, think about it. Actually, this is evident in the Buddha's time. The Buddha was still in Samsara when he, when, after he attained enlightenment, isn't it? Yeah. 
He was still walking around for 45 years. He was giving teachings for 45 years. But did he suffer? No, he didn't suffer. Otherwise, how can he be called Buddha? But he did feel pain when there are conditions for it. But he don't constantly feel pain because there are no conditions for constant pain. Yeah? However, the difference between him and us is when he experienced pain, he don't suffer. So he and the Arahants are evident that this is possible. That in fact, what is, what is uh, highlighted and taught in the Mahana Bodhisattva path is not something divorced from the Pali Canon, you know. <laughs> yeah? Because as, as you look at this and you consider what I've just said, all this is still in line with what you can see in Pali Canon. It's still in line, isn't it? There's no contradiction. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, oppose what was described. You don't need the Buddha to float around in some magical way, you know. No. Yeah, you don't need that. And what it means is that here, the, the, the Zen tradition, yeah, our Zen masters from the past, they say, Tang Xia Chen Fu. Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is possible that or if you consider the later Zen, yeah, the Tathagata Gaba's uh, uh, teaching, Rulai Zhang the Sisyang, not wrong what? Yes. <coughs> Suffer. No. He experienced physical pain. Yeah, but he don't suffer because of that pain. Mm. Can you all understand this? May not be easier. Eh? Do you think it's possible? Possible for the Buddha. For us, not so possible, isn't it? Rubbish. <laughs> for us, we experience this every day. How many of you have your breakfast already? How many of you have not? Do you experience hunger? Do you suffer because of that? Some of you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the distinction. You may say, but that's different from getting your hands chopped off. You know, of course it's different because we are not so enlightened yet. Ma. Uh, but we are more enlightened in a way than children. Children, when they experience hunger, oh, she's so mad, oh, mommy, I'm very hungry. Cannot. Yeah? Yeah, kids, they, they wet themselves. They, they really suffer. You know, see them, they don't understand what's happening. Yeah? But I, 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 I would suppose most, if not all of us, don't wet ourselves anymore. Okay? Okay? But something similar to wetting ourselves. Let's say you get caught in the rain. We are also wet. Isn't it? Yeah? Kids are very cute, you know. You pass them an idea, they really hold on to it. Yeah? You tell, if you tell them that you get your shoes wet, oh, it's a very bad thing. Because for most parents, ma, you get your shoe wet, then later the smell, and then you go, oh, yeah. so oh, you, you convince your child. Oh, yeah, oh, you get your shoe wet, oh, very bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then one day, so initially, the child has no idea that having the shoe wet is bad, you know. You plant this idea, you convince the child, and you maybe even cane the child. Oh, so the child now, okay, shoe wet is suffering. So one day, rain, then, or maybe she walk, uh, your, your child, she or he, walk, 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 then a friend bump into her, then she step into the puddle, what are you, what? <laughs> come back. What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? My shoe wet. Is there a big deal with the shoe wet? No. Yeah, is, there a, is there a big deal with being hungry? I mean, if you go hungry for a prolonged period, you, you will die. <laughs> yeah. that, that doesn't change whether you are happy or sad over it. That's the objective reality yeah, that will happen regardless of what you think. Yeah. A lot of our suffering is due to our subjective thinking. Understand? Uh, the Buddha's subjective part is totally purified. Yeah? In a way, he no longer has a subjective part anymore. 
because he's always looking at things as they are. So, in that sense, objective. Subjective and objective become one. Uh, okay? Yeah, thank you for your question. Every, anybody else? So, hmm, quite a sombering moment, isn't it? Yeah. After eight lessons, the ninth lesson, huh? Samsara and Nibbana, huh? Same, same. Yet not so same. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. <laughs> Telling a lie ten times, it doesn't make it a truth. Yeah, it just starts to think it's a truth. But in this case, it's not that you think it's a truth or not. It is that we grasp onto this duality as truth. But yet the truth is still not that. Ah, the truth is still not that. That's why we suffer. Because the truth remains the way it is. The truth, don't care what we think. The truth is not interested in our opinion or our preference. Yeah. The truth goes its way and that's why sometimes we get disappointed. But the truth didn't do it to hurt us. We get frustrated. But the truth didn't intend to, to punish us as well. The truth is just the truth. Yeah? So, uh, when we don't see it correctly and we grasp onto the duality of everything, and this is, this is just highlighting the end goal portion. But it applies to every other thing, no? that we live, we live in our own world of duality. And we grasp onto this duality as really you know, dichotomous, really independent of each other. Yeah? But reality is another thing. Mm. So, um, that's really just this one thing, yeah. There's suffering and then absence of suffering. Yeah. But then to help us, then the Buddha use a name to describe the absence of suffering, yeah. Niroda, nirvana, yeah. the extinguishing of defilement, the extinguishing of craving and clinging, the extinguishing of suffering. So, uh, so, after all the practice, the removal of suffering, the removal of ignorance, and so on, they are, this duality is not as tangible as it is also. Yeah? When we say it's not tangible, it doesn't mean it don't exist. No? Uh, remember? Yeah? Tastiness of laksa is dependent arising, so it's not so tangible, but when you experience it, it's still there. Well, yeah. uh, so don't be mistaken. Oh, in that case, no Nibbana. Yeah, there is Nibbana. Yeah. Now, do we suffer? Yes, we suffer. But we, we can work towards the reduction and eventual removal of suffering. So for us at this stage, this should be understood as such. But for those who are uh, Arahants, Pachika Buddha, and even Bodhisattva, then it is, to <coughs> it is to help them progress to the stage of the Buddha. Yeah. Uh, in a way, this part is more for the Bodhisattva, uh, according to my late ordination teacher. For the Buddhas, they don't have the issue with this duality as well. Yeah. For the Bodhisattvas, uh, they they may still consider, ah, there's a lot of merits I must go and cultivate, there's a lot of paramita that I must you know, bring to com completion, that I must increase, yeah, and I must decrease my defilement, I must work on all these things. Yeah. Uh, but this last part is really to highlight, no, 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 look again, yeah, think again. Mm. Think again. Now, if even the fruits the outcome, yeah, and the earlier part, the path, and then also worldly things. If, if is there anything else that's not covered? Every single possible thing, uh, is covered in these three categories. 
If all things in this way are all dependent arising, conditional arising, and hence empty in nature, yeah, not permanent, not unchanging, not inherent, yeah, not intrinsically existing, not innate, empty of any of these qualities. So when there are conditions, then they can happen. No conditions don't happen. So then what are we grasping onto? We are grasping onto the things that we, our perception of these things. Reality is that it does keep changing. Reality is, is intangible. Reality is, it is ephemeral. But we perceive it as very tangible, very real. And from there, from this wrong perception, we see wrongly, ignorance, but we grasp on to this wrong seeing, we form a delusion about things. And because of this delusion, we, we think that we overvalue it. The things that are pleasant to us, we overvalue it and give rise to greed, desire, craving yeah, for more. For those that is unpleasant, we also overvalue it. Because thinking that is so tangible, then it causes us to be frustrated, <clears throat> yeah, to be upset. And sometimes when the pain is too unbearable to, to then lash, lash back with anger, with hatred, yeah, wanting to hurt. From this, greed, hatred and delusion arise. But now if we were to remove the root cause, which is that we don't see clearly, now we see clearly, then the whole, the whole, the whole structure collapse, as the Buddha described in the sutra. You, housemaker, I see you. Architect, I see you. No longer will you construct another house. <laughs> yeah. The architect is the ego. Yeah. And then from there arise all the you know, problems we have. So, Wu Zi Yu Du once you realize to this point, then you come to the to the knowledge, the wisdom that ha huh, all my life now try to imagine okay <laughs> that at this stage of, of the sutra you, you are we are talking about not unenlightened beings anymore. We are talking about beings who have have culminated in Aeons of practices. So they can see all that they have done that at this point everything that the, the dichotomy of everything, the duality of everything falls away. Then they realize that ah, all these lives, aeons of grasping is over nothing. They're not, there's nothing that you can grasp onto anyway. As my teacher would use the Chinese phrase, uh, yeah. that all phenomena, you cannot attain it. You may think, no, I, I bought an iPhone, or I have a house. Yeah. Only a blip in the spectrum, in the course of time. And even as it, as there's a blip, it is dependent arising. Even as you pay pay out for twenty years, is it yours? Is it yours? Which part of the so-called house is yours? Which part of the so-called space that is enclosed by the four wall is something real and tangible? Yeah, that you call the house. All these things are from constructs, yeah? dependent on condition coming together, then you call that your house. And because we all want to live in harmony, we come up with the concept of ownership, of deed. Of deed. If it, the house is truly yours, you don't need a deed. The deed is so that no one can argue in a court of law. But when there's war, 
anyone can stay in your house. <laughs> yeah. But even when without war, you are just temporarily staying in the house because everybody okay la, okay la, we agree la. You have the paper, okay, I'll let you stay. <laughs> That's all, you know. And if even the house which is usually the largest item of possession that we have is like that. What more of anything else? Now, this may seem scary, yeah. But the good news is Iwu Swotaku. And again, this is for someone who have really seen it, okay? Not not where we are now. Now we are just imagining, oh if it's like that then how? If you have completely seen it in this way, then you realize that it's not a question of letting go or not. Nothing to grasp onto, how to let go. <laughs> and that's why right at the start I say, don't let go. Enlightened beings also don't let go. We also don't let go. We don't let go because we think it's very real. So we keep trying to grasp onto things, hold on to things. Enlightened beings also don't let go. Why? Because they see that there's nothing to grasp onto. Nothing to grasp onto. So here is this, up to this stage is about those who are at the enlightened stage already, right at the end. Yeah. So they are able to say, "Iu so the ku, puti sato." That the that the Buddhisattva, the one who is striving in this way, puti sato i pura polomito ku, dependent on the wisdom that is perfected, the perfection of wisdom. I pura polomito ku, sing wu guai, wu guai ku. Despite saying that all is dependent on arising and so on, ah, precisely because it's dependent on arising, the Buddhisattva is dependent on the perfection of wisdom. It's true perfecting of wisdom that you see that nothing to grasp onto. And once at this point, we still feel that it's very real. So if you, if, if you if you are someone who feels it's very real, and someone can tell you, nothing to grasp on to. La. How does it feel? You feel very hurt, you know. You feel very, very bewildered. You feel like that person don't understand you. It is like we telling our kid, keep playing with your stupid game. It's useless. La. Then our child, no, it's not useless. Minecraft is very important. <laughs> I really got a lot of points, you know. Mommy, you... You switch off my computer, I haven't saved. It's very real to the child. <laughs> yeah. But for us, like, you and your stupid game. No! My friends are waiting for us. We are going to charge into the, into the palace. It's very real to them. So similarly, for unenlightened beings to see this statement, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. But if you can, if you have, if you st- are able to get your child to somehow become an adult with adult mind and then to step out, then he will see that it's really just a game. Yeah? Then the realization that there's nothing much except a game is not frightening. When you truly see it, it's not frightening. When you don't see it and someone tells you the message, why wow, it's, it's hurting, you know? it's almost insulting. What do you mean it's just a game? Yeah, it's a very important game, <laughs> no less. <laughs> yeah, but for the enlightened being, Yu Swadaku, Pudisato, I Purapo Mintoku, Sing Wu Kwai. Yeah, there's no preoccupation, there's no there's no this uh, here I translate the earlier days I translate as as obstacle, huh? I, I believe the word is obstacle that I use. Is it correct? Yeah. Mm. Uh, obstacle to what? Obstacle to no suffering. Yeah, but today I would want to include another phrase, which is that uh, something that weigh you down, something that burden you. Yeah? Yeah, something that preoccupies you, yeah? that hold you back. And in, the, in that sense, it's an obstacle. Yeah? And what is that that forms an obstacle that holds you down, that weighs you down? It is thinking that there's all these things that is that is that is so important that you must protect, you know. 
Yeah, that's the house you must protect because it's yours. If it has the me, it has the my, my this, my that, oh, my position, my relationship, that is so tangible. I must keep it in this way. It must not change. Yeah. It's all these concepts that's weighing us down. Causing us not to be able to be free. To be free of suffering. To be free to love. To be free to care. Yeah, but because of all that, we get bogged down. Sing you guai. Here, once you see that, actually, no problem. Yeah. Once you see clearly that all things are really intangible, and intangible is not a bad thing. Yeah. That is due to conditions that there is this relationship. So, well, then you have to cherish it. It's not a fearful thing to be afraid of. But in fact, then you see that, well, because the relationship depends on condition, that's why now it's feeling, because ah, this person and that person is not putting in the right conditions. Isn't it? Instead of thinking, oh, now that you and me, I, I wrote, we ROM, we sign on the paper, and then that's it, you must love me. And it, it is this unspoken expectation that causes us to be so upset when the other person when, when this thing falls out. But when you realize that, or, or at, the same time, at the same time, if I may, it is this unspoken expectation that causes us to take things for granted. <laughs> yeah. And then when things break down, hey, why? Ah? So this realization is not a doesn't have to be a scary thing. In fact, it helps us to see things in perspective, in the right perspective, to realize that nothing can be, you cannot take anything for granted, that everything requires your effort. Now, some of us may still say, <laughs> put in effort, put in effort. Okay. Yeah. But, in sang, no li, guo sang, sui yuan. Even for relationship, you put in tons of effort. Yeah, every day put in effort, but it may not it may still not work out. Huh? Why? Because in a relationship it takes two to clap. It takes two to clap. So then you don't set yourself up for unnecessary disappointment because you don't have unrealistic expectations. You have realistic expectation of how things will pan out. Seeing clearly that your involvement is only part of the equation. The other person must play a part. Then you won't be the kind of like Self-suffering person, uh. yeah. Then la, well, I put in effort, I put in effort. Then you realize that no, that I put in is not good enough. You also have to put in. Then you will not feel so so like bad when you ask that person to commit. Yeah, I've counseled so many individuals. They feel they feel bad to demand. You know, you know, like no, it's not about being like get gao no. But it's like when you see clearly that. It, Everybody must play a part. Then you just matter of factly say, "No, I do something. You must do something also. It takes two to clap. We must work together." Yeah, the relationship, like anything else, don't just happen by chance. Hang on, he he raised his hand first. Yes. Yes. Mm. Differentiate what? Achievement. Achievement. Very good question. Um, there's often this uh, this struggle for Buddhists. Yeah. Uh, initially, we come into Buddhism, we we pray for be ping an, ah, ping an, sun sun, and so on. Yeah. Then we may even pray for for wealth, ah, this and that. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. Then you come for Heart Sutra, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's yala like that. Yeah. Uh, well, don't worry. Um, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, for someone who has reached a certain level of, of appreciation of the teachings, it doesn't mean that. <coughs> first of all, while your question is directed to how do we then distinguish between achievements, yeah. But perhaps the before and after of this question is even more interesting which is, 
if there's no distinction, then why should I put in effort? If there's no distinction, so what if I succeed or not succeed? Isn't it? Yeah? So the before and after is even more interesting. I help you ask. Uh. Uh. So why should I put in effort if there's no distinction? There is still distinction because the dependent arising result has distinction. You put in effort, you get, you get different results. Ma. Whether it's spiritual practice or your grades or your, or your work. But the distinction, the main distinction is instead of seeing the result as so real and tangible that you must fight for aggressively, unscrupulous, uh, unscrupulously, <laughs> scrupulous, <laughs> goodness, yeah, then you, you set your, your, our mind and intention on the, the larger picture. That instead of considering the outcome as just you, you see the outcome as the result of so many individuals. That is not just your success. Now, sometimes I've seen when I was younger, uh, principals, teachers, when they get awards, and they, they do say such things. Now, this, this uh, award is not about me. It's about the whole school. It's the success of the whole school. And when I was a young kid, I was like, right. <laughs> But after all these years, I don't know how much they, they appreciate this whole picture. But I think the truth is a truth, is a truth, is a truth. Whether you attend this class or not, I'm sure as you are listening to this, uh, it, may, it, it may resound in you because actually we see it here and there. As we grow up, we start to appreciate that hey, now one person cannot do everything. You start to appreciate that the outcome depends on everybody. In that case, then, your attachment towards the outcome being yours is not so strong. Yeah? Then why should you still work hard? Uh, then, considering with compassion. Yeah? And again, that compassion is honed by wisdom. Yeah? To see that so many beings are suffering. Yeah? And that's how uh, bodhisattvas on the surface may look like anybody else working hard. Yeah, but they work hard not for their own self anymore. Uh, not for their own self anymore. Mm. I don't know whether it, it answers your question. Or is there something else that you want to clarify? Yes. Yeah. Okay. When we say that it's intangible, we must understand that our usual uh, uh, notion yeah, of the word tangible and intangible is, is quite different from what we are talking about here. When we say something is tangible, we usually look at it as concrete, solid, permanent and everlasting. When we say it's intangible, it's almost like it doesn't exist. Yeah. Here, when we talk about intangible, is that it's neither of this, you know. Yeah. That is impermanent, changing. Yeah. So, just like the laksa taste or the laksa itself, we say that it's intangible because it's not so concrete and independently existing. Yeah. It is a bit different from uh, our usual usage of the word int intangible in a sense that we usually look at intangible as one is more solid than the other. The, the less solid is intangible. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so just like the laksa taste, the laksa itself, the house and room, all the examples we have gone through, when we say that something is intangible, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All, all of us are successful in some ways. We have worked hard <coughs> and we have accomplished some results. On some occasions, we do fail. Yeah? We fall short and we don't get that result. We cannot say that the results you have don't exist. Yeah? And your failure or the absence of the success don't exist also. They do exist. Yeah? But in terms of the principle of emptiness, they are equal. Yeah, they are equal. Tell me, uh, from your question, what is the impact on you? Because, as I said, the before and after is more important. For you, what, what is the impact of, on you before and after? <coughs> then perhaps we can address that. Huh? 
Ага. Ага. Come again. You are saying that Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Nothing is solid, concrete and tangible. Yes. Hold Wait, repeat yourself. Yeah, wait, hang on. Let me repeat what I heard you say, okay? And see whether that's what you mean. You are saying that there's a tangible and intangible. And then uh, here we say that nothing is tangible. And somehow you, you then conclude that in that case, how do, we, um, how do we cling on to the... Ah, okay, so that's your question. Why do we then still cling on to our achievement? Is that a question? Well, it's because we haven't truly really seen that it's intangible. Today, it's just a, an exercise you know, in our mind. Yeah? Uh, for us to fully appreciate that <coughs> all the achievement that we have, it's not that it's not that. Again, it's, it's not that it's not that. It's really there, ma. When you eat laksa, there's a taste, ma. Uh, so we are not saying that, oh, from this A, B, C, then suddenly, no achievement. You are not manager, he's not an engineer, no teacher, no. no. Yeah? Uh, just like here, no I, no form and so forever. No. It's not that it's not no, no, no. It's that there's no permanent inherentness. So your achievement, question, is your achievement, whatever achievement we have, not just you, whatever ach achievement we have, is it permanent? Not permanent, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, is it uh, independently arising? Is it done by ourselves, in other words? Um, is it, does it exist, does it arise because of many individuals? In that case, can we still say that it's purely my achievement? Cannot, isn't it? And even with our, our reflection, we probably only cover a limited scope of those who are involved. If you go on to the second and third tier yeah, of the exercise that I've been asking you all to do, some of you have been religiously submitting. Yeah. I have not been religiously marking. <laughs> I apologize. The <laughs> yeah. whole stack is still in my office. Yeah. Uh, but if we go through that, then you, you see that yeah, whatever quality or achievement or things that we hold dear or not dear to us, uh, depends on multitude of conditions, even at the first layer. When you go to the second layer, second layer mean, meaning those conditions for the result, they themselves, the conditions themselves, in turn, require other conditions. Understand? So, for example, if I use laksa, the taste requires the laksa itself, the cook, the heat, water, and so on, the ingredients, plus our involvement, body and mind, the state of our emotions, state of our physical well-being, the environment, and so on and so forth. Now, then, this is just the first layer. Second layer, the noodles requires other ingredients to make. Yeah, individuals, including those who drive the pickup to, to send things around. Yeah? Then if you go to a third le level, even the pickup needs to be dissected. Well, once you reach third level, usually <laughs> it's massive, you know. Yeah. And that's just one bowl of laksa. <laughs> can, can you, at least, at least conceptually, the important thing is, in the class, um, I can understand the, the struggle. And yesterday, at the, at the mindfulness seminar, I had this conversation with Dr. Ang, Ang Bing Chu. So, we were, he was, she was sharing with me that um, there seems to be this trend yeah, that in the past they, they, they felt that uh, the, the importance of the teachings, yeah? I mean, all the while we feel that way. 
Uh, but in the in the late 80s, coming to 90s, when the RK was going to be cut off, so some of them were anxious. They were like, "Hey, we need to have replacement for that teaching, yeah, the systematic teaching of the Buddha's uh, the Dharma." So uh, in the 90s, there was this whole series of classes. But over the 10, 20 years until th today, she says that she has a lot of feedback from people and she, she's seen some Buddhists attend Chu Jipan, Zhong Jipan, Gao Jipan, or whatever, uh, convert to other religion. <laughs> yeah. and, and when they go on stage to give the testimony, they say, I study all that, but never helped me. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the this is one part I want to address here, which is that within the class, um, I hope I have given you enough examples to see how to how you can see the teachings in your life. Okay, uh, but I cannot help you or force you or follow you around every day to see. Hey, see this part. This part is dependent arising also. Uh, that part also depend. Uh, that part that that I can't do lah. Okay. Uh, it's just like mathematics, the teacher gives you some examples and then go through some problem sums. But after that, it's up to you to go and apply, uh, do tenure series and so on and so forth. In the case of mathematics, it is purely for, in a way, for exams. But in fact, for mathematics, beyond school, we can use it in our life. But there are those who just give it back to the teachers and never use it. Hang on. Uh. So... Um, what I need you and everybody to do is at least see whether the concept makes sense. Okay? Yeah. If you can at least understand the concept first, yeah, then after that uh uh after that try to appreciate the teachings, really appreciate and see it in various aspects first. Yeah. I, I like the fact that you are trying to apply it directly on Hey, how about my attachment to my achievement? Yeah. Um, for some people, what I've just explained about our achievement immediately severe the, the attachment. Yeah, at least it did for me. Uh, way back in 2006, before the, the full-length workshop came about, there was this evening, at about 10 plus 11, a group of youth, somehow they were still around, came and see me in the cubicle, and they asked me, how do we overcome pride? Yeah. How do we overcome pride? And that's linked to achievement. Yeah. If you have achievement, you are you have pride. Yeah. And some may even develop to arrogance. If you have no achievement, then we have inferiority complex. We feel miserable. So, because I was in and out about this reflection, so I spontaneously told them what I just shared. Yeah. But not so fully full form yet. La. I told them, well, if you consider what you are proud of, are you totally responsible for it? Are there other factors involved? The answer has to be yes. Yeah. And I can't remember whether that night or subsequently I shared about my own experience of coding, yeah, writing programs. I mean, as far as the different disciplines and fields are concerned, it's very specialized. Yeah some more than the other. In fact, you take any professional, yeah, any professions, how many people can balance an account sheet? Yeah? Not, not, not that easy, no. <laughs> yeah. can be quite confusing at times. And then every year there's new tax law. Yeah. Most people would agree that, wow, doctor very, very tight, no? wow, can save people's life. But in a way, if you take away the, the impact, which is that you save or you kill someone, yeah, or you save or you don't save someone, then you balance or don't balance an account sheet is not, not, not anything trivial compared to saving a person's life, isn't it? Yeah, you still need knowledge, experience and, and skill. Yeah. But all that, all that don't happen by chance. All that don't depend on just that one person. Each time the surgeon lay out the whole OR and then you know, get everybody, okay, ready, okay, check, pause, everything, and he does that incision. It's not just him doing the incision, you know. It is all the, all the people behind him that allow him to do this incision. For him to do the incision, there must be the cadaver 
that he he cut when he was a houseman, yeah, including when he was a a a, a student. There must be all those lecturers who explain to them the process, the different the different blades for for cutting, yeah. So although he's the final person to do that incision, that act itself, yeah, comes from the whole line of doctors and technicians and and medical professions professionals who actually assisted him yeah, along the way. Likewise, when we cook, yeah, and whatever achievement that you you may be considering, or maybe not. Maybe you are not considering your own achievement that you are attached to. Maybe you are trying to help someone else to achieve the non-clinging. Maybe you know of someone who is very attached to whatever they have achieved. Yeah. You may or not be able to share with him or her this way of looking at things. But it's not just a way of looking at things. That's the way things are. It's just that we don't see it this way. We tend to see that I am the one who do it, or I didn't do it. I am the one who didn't do it. <laughs> so when you think I am the one who do it, pride arise, attachment, ego become reinforced. When you when you see that it, it, it you didn't do it, then it's I who didn't do it. Then I am inferior. I am useless. I this I that. It's again the I, but actually it's not you. <laughs> there are a lot of conditions. Yeah, there are a lot of conditions. No. Before you, yes. Mm, yes and no. Yeah. Okay, so tell me what you understand about the word karma. Uh, okay, very good. So when we talk about karma, <coughs> when we talk about karma. Uh, First of all, the word karma is totally focused on just the action. Okay, yeah. So actions can occur in the past, past life, can be occur, can occur in this life, in the past. It can occur in the present, and it refers also to future actions. Yeah. So karma is not just about the past; it's about all the actions that can possibly happen. So far, so good. When we talk about karma. We usually go beyond that. Usually, when we talk about karma, we are talking about the effect of karma that we call vipaka. Vipaka is the fruit of the karma. Yeah, when we saw, we say in guo, in guo. Vipaka is the guo. <laughs> yeah. So we we are usually using karma to include both. Oh, so just to clarify this. Yeah. Uh, this is a common, um, not so much misconception lah, uh, but. Uh, the the common lingo that we are used to. Um, so, that being the case, then we have to ask ourselves: Is our present totally governed by our past? Is it totally governed by our past? Does it mean that whatever has happened in the past uh, totally define what will happen today? Yeah, are we totally absolved of involvement? The answer is no. The past, once it's planted, first of all, for it to ripen, require our active involvement in the present life. Okay, there are some fruits that has already ripened because of our last moment in the past life. But once we are born now, our day to day, yeah, the state of our mind nourishes the past seeds and plants new seeds yeah, of karma. Yeah, of karmic seed. This process is very dynamic. Yeah, so it is not like 
uh, it is not like what, how we usually think of karma, where it's like watching a movie. It's already planted, yeah? already shot. The movie is already shot. We are just watching the outcome. Now, this is the deterministic fate kind of concept. The Buddha didn't teach this concept. Didn't. What he teach is more like, uh, more like uh, playing a game. Yeah, there are certain rules involved. Yeah, but the outcome is not fixed yet. Mm. Yeah, in the first round maybe you win. The second round maybe if you are lax, you you, you may just lose the whole game. Uh, understand? Uh, so, uh, what it means is to come back to your question. Uh, the outcome, the present outcome is determined by and influenced by both the past karma that was done but heavily influenced by our present karma. Ah. Oh. And that's why the focus on yin sang no li, guo sang yao sui yuan. Because our present, in terms of karma, our present one is superior to the past one. Yeah, because this is what we can control and it has very strong impact. But uh, besides these two sets of karma, there's the present conditions. Uh, that is separate from what we can do. Yin, yuan, guo, bao. So the yuan, a lot of other people involved. Ma. Uh, oh. So guo sang jiao sui yuan. Okay? Before you, her. Yes. No, it's not just the individual. Mm. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't just yeah and go on. We must, we must really get this across, huh? Because the the rest, if they just miss that part, then they will still only hear the first part, which is that it's only the the surgeon. On it's either you see the dichotomy, either only the surgeon or not the the surgeon. No, I say not only the surgeon. Understand the difference? We usually think it's only the surgeon involved. Yeah. Once we say, oh, there are a lot of people involved, oh, so it's not the surgeon. Lah. But cannot be ma, surgeon is cutting ma. No, that's not what we are saying. We are saying not only the surgeon is involved. All the teachers, all the lab technicians, all the, including the dead people who, who, that he used to cut and practice. Yeah. All that together with his hand yeah, is involved. So not just him. So let me let me share her question first. Uh. Her question is: So, if that is the case, what she she see is that then the Buddhist principle seem to be more in line with with socialist communist uh, 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 ideology than capitalist approach. Uh, first of all, nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, but I can appreciate where you are coming from. Uh, the first thing is. While this is a Buddhist principle, we say that it is not that we go and make things this way, no. Socialists or communists and capitalists is a human construct to make things function this way. Okay? By nature, there's no communists or, or, or capitalists. Okay? Understand? When we talk about F equals to MA, it is not that Isaac Newton come out of this rule, then everything worked that way. Yeah? When he discovered the law of gravity, it is not that before that, we all float around. <laughs> then one day, Isaac Newton said, ah, everything is attracted to other bodies of masses. Eh? <laughs> what happened? Uh? <laughs> no. Uh? So similarly, it is not that the Buddha discovered the truth and then we start to suffer. It is not that before that, things are 
inherent. Then the Buddha discovered or, or claimed that it's, it's, it's not, then it becomes the way it is. So it's not that we are, we are having the Buddhist teaching to change things. It is that the Buddha discovered that it's like that. Yeah? So whether or not uh, communists or capitalists fits in with the Buddhist teaching, that's besides the point. Because if they don't fit in with this model, it means that they are not in line with reality. But we cannot change reality to fit in with either one. So I'm not for communists or socialists for that matter, nor I'm not, I'm not, I'm not for capitalists. But I'm not against either one also. Whichever works. Yeah? Uh, but this only uh, resolves the conflict of whether these three school of thoughts are in conflict or in unison. It resolves the, the issue of whether we... Uh, we, we, we okay, never mind. <laughs> Uh, but it doesn't address your question directly, which is, okay, the current system that most of the world function is in a capitalist mode. Yeah? Uh, how, does, how does a Buddhist learning this yeah, uh, then function in a capitalist world? Yeah, perhaps that's the question that you want to... But I had to address that first because, you know, otherwise there seems to be this whatever. So... Um, now, when we say that it is not just the surgeon involved, it doesn't change the fact that he is the one who is doing the cutting. Isn't it? Yeah? Just because we say that the tastiness arises dependent on condition, doesn't mean you don't have to pay money. No. <laughs> ah. Agree? But as to whether you should be paying uh, you should be paying $20 for a bowl of laksa or $2 or 150, that's another thing. Yeah? Supposedly, in a capitalistic system, it's supposed to be purely supply-demand. Purely supply-demand. But today, I'm, I'm not an economist. I, in fact, I didn't even study economics. Yeah? Uh, but I would like to think that I, I read here and there, and I have friends who are economists and accountants and so on. So I glean a bit from them. My conclusion is this. Uh, so far, there's no pure uh, market-driven economy. There's no country that is purely market-driven. Yeah. Why? If, if it's purely market-driven, then governments cannot do stimulus. Yeah. Stimulus packages. Yeah. Then regulation has to be removed totally, uh, in, in a sense. Yeah. In a pure capitalist uh, system. Yeah. Today, we are, we are in a uh, semi, you know, there are a lot of different systems. Oh. So, uh, as to whether you should pay for this price or that price, uh, that is the capitalist model. Yeah. Communist model is totally different. It's about that. And again, is there a pure communist model? Pure socialist model? No. Yeah. All these words describe an ideology, but in practice, oftentimes, not com incomplete. Yeah. Oh. Okay? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> when he stayed, when, when he's. Okay. Path, okay. Hmm, what I think. Let me first say that if a person wants to be a Bodhisattva, don't be a Bodhisattva only when you're about to die. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah. You should be a Bodhisattva starting from today. Yeah? Then with that in mind, uh, number one, chances are when you're about to die, you know what to do. Yeah? But in case for a person who may not actively practice the path, then at that point, then what should he do? 
he should do what he is comfortable with. There are people who say, oh, but we are Buddhist ma, so we should donate everything out, even your organs and everything. Then there are those who say, no, cannot. If you do that, uh, you cut, uh, then later, well, your, your, your attachment, if, what if you, are, you still have... So, so students have come to ask me this question. Is it okay? Is it not okay? This is why I tell them. I say, even when you are alive, do you donate blood? If a person don't do, donate blood, is he a bad person? No. Yeah. Uh, some people donate on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, there are people who don't donate on a regular basis for various reasons. Does it make that person a bad person? Is he then a bad Buddhist? No, there's no such thing inside the Buddhist teaching that says you don't donate regularly, you're a bad Buddhist. No. Yeah. But if you, there are certain things that the Buddha stipulate as that this behavior are priority towards enlightenment. You must not engage in killing, stealing, sexual misconduct and lying. You know this noble eightfold path, there's no mention about charity. Why? Because charity is not a direct requisite for enlightenment. To remove remove ego, remove ignorance, charity is not a direct requisite. Yeah? However, if you want to become a Buddha, you want to walk the Bodhisattva path, charity, yeah, giving is a supporting element, a, a crucial supporting element. It's one of the perfections. Now, just because it's a perfection, does it mean that we can do it? Similarly, just because there's the five precepts, there's all the practice, there's medit- concentration as a requisite for enlightenment, does it mean that all of us, once we hear about it, we meditate eight hours a day? No. Does it mean that you are not a Buddhist? No. <laughs> yeah, you are trying. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, so similarly, for a Bud- person trying to be a Bodhisattva or trying to walk the Bodhisattva path, in my opinion, always do what you can and plus a bit more. But don't, don't measure yourself. When we look at the Bodhisattvas and Buddhas, we set them as our ideal, as our direction. Okay? Direction is different from uh, being there. Understand? Yeah? When you see a plane take off you are, and you think, ah, this plane is going to US, you cannot just, then just say, I want to be there in the sky now. <laughs> Yeah, and then you climb up the building, and the plane fly past, and then you <laughs> <laughs> cannot. You 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 just plunge. Uh. Yeah, do what you can at that point. Now you are on the ground. The next step to do is go and buy an air ticket. Uh, you cannot then say no, ma. I must be there. I must be there. Yeah, you want to be there ultimately, but not there yet. Uh, so do what you can. At this point, you must buy an air ticket. Okay, buy an air ticket. And on that, on that morning, take a bus or a train or a cab or drive there to the airport. You must do that. Doing that has nothing to do with the country you want to be in. But it is a necessary step to go there. Yeah. So if a person has cultivated to a certain point where he's not attached, when we say not attached to the family, then again there's another question. Huh? Put up your family anymore? No. <laughs> yeah. Again, from an unenlightened point of view, that seems very heartless, huh? Very heartless. Well, I don't care about family. No. It means the person has reached a point where you are able to care without attachment. Uh, this, is, this is the difficult part. Uh, and this is why we bow down to Buddha. Ma. If he do something that anybody can do, why bow down to him? <laughs> yeah? uh, so if you find that you are at the stage where you are still very attached to your family, yeah? And, you, and the only way for you to express your care and love for them is to leave behind them an inter- inheritance. Go ahead. But still, you have to consider, try, try, okay? Try to use your wisdom and consider. Is your child, is, are your children of those tendency to be able to appreciate that wealth with gratitude and make good use of the wealth, the inheritance? Or are our children, unfortunately, uh, yeah, power and money can corrupt. Yeah. Especially when it comes in a huge sum. You give them one dollar a day, no corruption. Yeah. You give them over over ten years, how much is that? Three hundred times ten, thirty thousand. Just one dollar a day won't corrupt them for for thirty years or for ten years. But if you give them thirty thousand in, instantly, 
how many people can say they won't be corrupted? Uh, so it's tricky. So some of those millionaires, they set up a foundation where that money is being given out in batches when certain conditions are met. Yeah. But sometimes this becomes just something for the children to work around, you know. Yeah. And we can see it from movies and in real life. Uh, so we have to consider yeah, what is best for them as well. If we are attached to them, we should also consider what is best for them. Yeah. Sometimes the best for them is not to give them everything. Yeah. Okay. I think I have I over short time. Oh yeah, over short time. So you so the go put it out or minto sing quiet. So if we can uh next week is the last lesson and I will wrap up but I, I, I want to do more of this, yeah, so that you all get uh get a get a uh, a really immersed understanding of okay, so Fine, this teaching beautiful. What do we do in our life? Okay? So I want you to read, read ahead on the notes and then write down your questions. Because qu question, good questions can come easily but can go easily also. Uh, dependent arising are our questions. Come, let's rise. Yuan Xiao San Zhang Zhu Fan Lao. Yuan Da Zhu Hui Zhen Ming Liao. 不愿罪障悉消除阿弥陀佛三文群